Well, I'd like to welcome you to Southside Bible Church and like to welcome anyone visiting. We are so glad when we have visitors who come and join us here to worship the living God. So we are grateful and hope you are blessed in your time here at our church. This morning, uh, worldwide, the Christian church, all believers, we celebrate that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead, and we call that the resurrection. That is the good news. You know, I wonder if you went home after the service and you kind of dropped by um, and picked up your mail that you've been forgetting to grab all week, and in it you have this real formal, legal-looking letter, and it has this nice letterhead from a law firm, and you open it up, and the letter states that you had a distant relative who had left you a very substantial amount as an inheritance. And because they had no more near relatives living at the time of their death, you're the sole inheritor. And it's in the amount of $20 million. It's got a seal and everything. Would you just throw the letter away? I'm not talking about, I get these things every week that $20 million from some guy in Africa sends your your account number and your social security number. I'm not talking about that. But this letter, because of the possibility, you just would have to look into it, wouldn't you? Well, the resurrection of Jesus Christ promises something that is so good, you just have to look into it. You just have to look at why Jesus and all these followers of him are hiding in a room when he had been crucified, and they are now fearing for their own deaths that the Roman soldiers will come and get them. Then on Sunday morning, they come running out. And they give their lives to preach that Jesus Christ has risen from the dead and all of them would die for that message except for John. The transforming power of this message is that you just can't throw the letter away. You have got to look into it. And I pray that some of you are here this morning for that very purpose to look into what is the resurrection of Jesus Christ means because it holds out a promise to your very greatest need. It deals with your future because death is coming no matter how much you try to ignore it and put your fingers in your ears and say, I can't hear you. It presses against your conscience and you can't really enjoy life to the fullest the way that you want to because it's just always there. It's speaking to you. I think the dumbest thing in the world is giving someone on death row a last meal. Do you think anyone has ever enjoyed that meal? And you're here, you can't enjoy life fully while you know this death day is coming upon you. And then we're told in the scriptures that that day there'll be a judgment day at the end of all of history, a judgment day at the throne of God where sin is going to be dealt with before a God who is perfectly holy, blazingly holy and just. And then thirdly, the resurrection talks about a lost relationship with God that is manifested, and you can, you can never find your way back home. We learned on Friday night that we, we've been separated from God, and, and you, you sit here and you know it. Every human being, it says that God stamped eternity in our hearts, and when everything's quiet, we, we know that there's a God, and we know that there's something not right. And so the resurrection of Jesus Christ has the answer for all of that. It's just too good not to look into it. The promise from God, what the resurrection teaches us, we have to look at. And so if you've come for that purpose, I am glad you're here, and I promise to you this morning that I will be truthful with you. I will tell you exactly what the Word of God says and not what I think you want to hear, not to try to get you to come join this church. I commit to tell you the very truth of what God's word says to you about this. And I'm gonna ask that you would be truthful with your own heart, that you would be honest with it and you would open it up and you wouldn't hide and that you really would let the word of God look into your heart this morning. And so we're gonna open up one of God's letters to his people. We're gonna be in the book of Romans this morning. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter four, this is where we're gonna spend our time only in one Verse, And we want to hear what is the good news of a resurrected Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And so let's pray, and then we'll open up Romans 4. (coughs) 
Father, we come before you, and there is a, there's a glory in this room with those who are dead in their trespasses and sins. And you gave them life like Lazarus. You said, come forth. And you opened their eyes to see Jesus as a treasure hidden in a field, and they sold everything that they could have this Christ. Lord, I thank you for all of his beauty, and we gather now with such joy to celebrate that he is risen. And because he is risen, we are alive, and we have eternal life in Christ Jesus. We have been brought back into relationship with you, O oh God. We thank you. We, we glory in this, and there is a great joy in this room this morning because of it. And we just thank you. It's because of you that we have this. And I pray for any who have come this morning to just open, open up this letter that's too good to be true. Lord, to hear what, what is it about this resurrection that has everyone so full of joy and lives being changed and the things that are being proclaimed. Lord, I, I pray that your spirit would speak to their hearts and the quietness of their hearts this morning as they listen to the word of God. And so, Lord, we look to you. We look to your Holy Spirit to do what no man can do. God, minister in our midst, we pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Romans chapter 4. I taught this in sun, Sunday school a few weeks ago, and I didn't finish, so I need to finish it. I apologize to those of you who are in there. You're going to hear a lot of the same things. And then the last couple of weeks, we've been looking in Genesis, and we looked at Abraham for two weeks, and I really want to wrap that up as well this morning. And so the good news is we are only going to look at one verse this morning, and the, the bad news is if you're visiting, sometimes that takes me an hour. <laughs> but this one verse, I believe, will clearly explain the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So to, to truly understand uh, the verse, it's the very last verse in the chapter, uh, I'm going to try to set the context and help you understand what Romans is about. Paul wrote this epistle the Apostle Paul, and the theme of it is in Romans 1, 16 through 17. I want to read that to you. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God. And there's this little preposition that means to bring you into the middle of a circle. The, the, I'm not ashamed of this gospel because it's the only thing that can bring you into this realm called salvation. So I, I'm not ashamed of it because nothing else will ever get you into this place of salvation. And it's for everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in this gospel the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written, but the righteous man shall live by faith. And so the theme of this epistle is how God can bring sinners into the, the place of salvation and this sweet saved place reconciled with God the Father. So the, the theme uh, it makes it pretty clear that we need salvation. And the question then is, from what? In the first three chapters of Romans, Paul's going to answer that question, and he begins first by showing Gentiles that by creation, my invisible attributes are clearly seen, my, my power and divine nature. So when you look at the glories of creation, the beach and the sun and all the things that we have, it tells you there's a God. It just, you can't get this beauty. If the, if the moon was any closer or further away, the earth would flood itself all like 73 times over again. It's just everything is in this perfect place, and so it demands that there's a God. And what Gentiles have done is they, they suppress that truth. I, I don't want to deal with that because I want to be God. I want to call my own shots. I mean, even today, we tell God what he has to do, what he has to be like, and how he has to act in our lives. We want to be God, and we know there's a God, and so in our unbelief, we push down and say, I don't want to deal with you, God. I don't, I don't want you. And it says you suppress it in unrighteousness. I want sin. I want to live my own way. And so there's a creator. We know it, but I don't want to deal with it. And then we come into the next chapter, and we come to the Jews and these were people that they weren't rejecting God. They were taking his law that had been given to them through Moses, and they were trying to live as righteous as you could by obeying the law and keeping every jot and tittle. And what happens is it says, you guys are great. You know how to teach. Don't commit adultery while you're committing adultery in your hearts. You're, you're teaching don't steal while you're in your heart coveting and stealing from all kinds. And so you kind of have the, the people who just reject God, and it says they give hearty approval to those who do the same. And then you have the religious people who are trying their hardest to climb this little ladder to get themselves to God. And Paul's theme is that you're both in the exact same place. 
So it doesn't matter whether you're just this out there murdering, killing, uh, adulterating, and all of these things, or whether you're in the church trying to just be a really good person every day to earn your way to God. You're both under the bondage of sin and separated from God. One isn't any better off. In fact, he says the Jews were worse off because you have the revelation of God that tells you how you should live. Your judgment actually is going to be worse. And so you're, you're both in this condition that you can't get yourself into the sphere of salvation. So just rejecting God and living it up isn't going to fix it, and getting moral and trying to keep the law to please God isn't going to fix your problem. I hope you've If you've never heard that this morning, I hope that could change your life because it changed mine. It can't fix it. It can't fix it. So how can good guys and bad guys get right with a really good God who's righteous and he's so holy he can't let sin be in his presence and he's a just God that he says the soul that sins must die. If I don't violate my character, I have to punish sin Because it's my very essence and nature. So how do people then under sin get into the presence of a God like that? What is the number one answer in the world today? What do you think is the number one answer in the world today? And I I hope you can yell it out if you want. It's works. It's law. Trying to do works. It's religion. Uh, We see it could be Mecca. Some it's terrorism to their God. And there's all these different things that they are trying to do in their own strength and in their own merits and efforts to get themselves right with God. It all teaches that there's something, every religion, false religion, you have to do something to bridge this gap between God and man. And you spend all of your days trying to figure out a way in your own strength, your own hands to fix this problem. And the problem is we've been made for God and we know that we're not right with him. And so everybody is trying to figure out how to fix it or at least how to find some satisfaction. And that is why the resurrection is such good news. It's worth looking into because it has the answer for this universal, massive, unchanging problem of how sinners, moral or immoral, can get into this realm of salvation, into a relationship with God who you've been made for and you'll never be happy without him. That's the answer. That's the question. So look with me in Romans 3, verse 21. But now, I preached a whole sermon on that. I'm not going to do that this morning. But now, and what that tells you, there's nothing that you could do There was no way for you to remedy this. And if there wasn't these two words, but now, we would have no hope. And because but now is in the Bible, we are filled with hope because God did something to fix the problem. But now, here's what God did. Man can't fix it. Romans 1 through 3, you can't fix your problem. You can't change your nature. You can't change that you're guilty before God. You can't fix it. But now. God has done something to fix the problem. And from now, Romans 3 till the end of chapter 4, uh, Paul is showing us what God did to fix the problem. He explains how guilty sinners can be brought back into a love relationship with God that is eternal. It will never end, and it's personal, and it's real. It's not external religion. It's knowing the living God dwelling within you in your very being. So God's answer... How to solve this problem, I can summarize in one word, praise the Lord, Jesus. Jesus, he was God's chosen instrument. He was his very dear and beloved son. He would be how God would reconcile sinners into this realm of salvation. He's the answer to everything. He's the answer to the resurrection. And so the question is how? How is he an answer? And this morning, we're going to look at this one word to hear the answer, and it's a Greek word. And so if you're visiting and you don't like Greek words, just hang with me as it's all of us are learning it for the first time. So it's logizomai. And so don't run from from the Greek word. If I had to give it an English word, I'd call it grace. And everyone loves grace, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And so logizomai is grace. It's the key to understanding grace the gospel. This word is an accounting term, and I'm going to make a confession. 
I was an accountant before I went to seminary. It's true. I was a really nerdy one. I, it's, this is hard for me. I, I loved numbers and balance sheets, and I just got excited about all that stuff. I loved inventories, and I could have just done it for my whole life if God didn't save me and call me to ministry. I didn't know how to dress. I was a typical accountant. My belt wasn't sticking out, but it might as well have been. And I want to share with you about this accounting term, logizomai. And it's confusing, and, and so I, I, I'm going to try to make it as simple as I know how. <clears throat> if you look at in accounting, there's these little debits and credits. They're called T accounts. So if you have a checking book, it's just as simple as debits and credits. And so in the T account is what I'm going to describe for you this morning. And in this account, I want you to put your name. And in this account, we're going to put Jesus Christ's name. And so I want you to come to your account. Is there any sin in your account? And what the Bible says is there's more than you even know as you sit here this morning. All of us know a tip of the iceberg. If we saw all of our sin right now before God, we would all fall down weeping and crying, saying, I, I, don't, I don't even know the, the, how deep and big my sin really is. I, it's infinite. And then if we come to our righteousness, and I've asked probably 200 unbelievers this question, do you have any righteousness in your account? And almost every one of them have told me yes. And what the Bible says is righteousness is doing the right things for the right reason. And in Romans 3, earlier, Paul says in verse 10, there, there's none righteous, no, not even one. There, there's not anybody who's righteous before God. In Isaiah 64, he says, your righteous acts are like a filthy garment before God. And so when you come smiling to God saying, look at all the things I did to get me into the realm of salvation, you're going to be smiling and you're going to be standing there holding a filthy rag when you see how holy God is. Everything that you've been leaning on is going to melt away. It's going to just fizzle in the presence of a holy God. There is none righteous, no, not even one before this God. And now I want you to come over to my favorite account the Lord Jesus Christ. Was there any sin in his account? The scriptures say he, he was a blameless, spotless lamb of God. There wasn't even one blemish. Was there any righteousness in his account? The Bible says it was infinite. In Romans 1.17, it says, in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed by faith. Well, the righteousness that is in Jesus Christ's account was infinite and perfect. He loved God with all of his heart, mind, soul, and strength, and his neighbor as himself every second that he walked this earth. It was a, he, he perfectly manifested the, the righteousness of God because he was. And so when you look in that account, I can't, I can't use hyperbole with how beautiful the righteousness is in his account. Marvel at it and worship at it this morning. Now I want you to hear Logitzomai, and this is what has changed my life and why I'll never be the same. God said, I'm going to take all of your sin, past, present, and future, because I'm God, I'm not bound by time. Every one of them. And I'm going to get some of it to Jesus' account. And I'm going to put them up on a cross. And I'm going to take that sin now, and I'm going to impute it to his account. And now everyone says the father turned his back on the son, but he didn't. The, the Greek is prostheos. They're now on the cross face to face. And they had perfect communion and fellowship for all of eternity. And now the father pulls out his sword of justice in Romans 8. And it says he, he didn't spare his own son. And he pulled it out. And he took that sword of justice. And he smote his own son. So what, if we went to hell, we'd have to pay for our sins for all of eternity. And in three hours, Jesus bore the full wrath of God for every sin that you ever committed on that cross. That's the word propitiation. It means to appease God's wrath. Jesus drained every drop of God's wrath for sin. <clears throat> Propitiated it. Unbelievable. And now our sins can be forgiven. And the other part of the gospel that I didn't even understand until I got out of seminary, and I think you need to hear it this morning, is that he says, now I'm going to take the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ that we talked about, and I'm going to get some of that to your account. And now I'm going to put in your account the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. So that when God the Father looks at you now, he sees the perfect righteousness of his own son. He, he looks at you and you are wrapped in the garment of Jesus Christ. So that now, uh, Paul says, you can have peace with God. Where once you were his enemy forever, 
There was nothing you could fix. In Jesus Christ, your sins have been dealt with. And they, they've been taken as far as the east is from the west. And God says, I will remember your sins no more. They're washed. They're cleansed. And you stand here positionally now wrapped in the garment of Jesus Christ. So if you sit here spending your whole life, I just don't think I'm good enough. I haven't done enough. The answer is God looks at you as if you live the life that Jesus Christ has lived. That's why I call this the grace of God. So if it's confusing, I'm going to make this as simple as I know how to. God will treat you as if you died the death that Jesus Christ died. And he will treat you as if you live the life that Jesus Christ lived. He'll put his son in a place that only you deserve to be on a cross so that he can put you in a place that only his son deserved to be in a love, eternal relationship with the Father. That is the grace of God. And so I hope as you sit here this morning, you say, I would do anything to have that gift of God. I would walk to New York on my hands if that's what it took to have this. And chapter three and four of Romans focus on this. And, and here's the most beautiful thing is you don't get what I just described by law. It's a gift. And so you don't look at this now and say, I'm gonna start working hard, change my character, reform my life, be a better person to get what Jesus did. That isn't it. The whole chapter is to show you that isn't how God gives his gifts to people. He's done it all in Jesus Christ. Logitzomai, he did everything necessary for your salvation. You can't get there by your merit. You can't prog progress by cleaning yourself up. You, you can't quit messing your life up and all your bad choices and say, I'm going to fix that. I'm going to join a church. I'm going to stop doing this and start doing that. I'm going to gain philosophy that just speaks all these things. I'm going to get my marriage exemplary, and then God will accept me. I'm going to be a good parent, and if I finally can be a good parent, God will accept me. I'm going to climb the corporate ladder. I'm going to climb the social ladder. I'm going to do all these things to get God's favor. You will never get this by having your stuff together. That is not God's way, yet that is the world's way. That is the world's way to get favor and to get acceptance. Are you surprised that they're complete opposites? God's way and the world's ways? That should be the best news to you that you've ever heard this morning is you don't have to clean yourself up and merit the favor and love of God. That's good news. Would you receive that this morning? Paul wants us to see that you get right with God by faith and not by works. And he really wants you to get this because he spends a whole chapter and a half on it. And in chapter four, he calls witnesses to the stand to prove that this is the way it's always been. Throughout redemptive history, the story of the Bible, it starts in Genesis and it ends in Revelation about his salvation. And he says, I want to show you Abraham got right with God by faith. David got right with God by faith. But the, the witness that he's going to cross-examine the longest and the hardest is this man named Abraham. And so who is Abraham? He was just an idolater that God chose and he called him out. And he says, Abraham, through you, I'm going to bless the world and all the nations through you. You're going to be the father of all who have faith. And Paul shows us that Abraham got right with God, not by being circumcised, not by keeping the law. His blessing came to him by believing what God said he would do. It's just an easy argument. Look at Romans 4.3. For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was logizomide. It was reckoned to him as righteousness. He believed and God put his righteousness to his account. And when the whole argument of Paul is when God said this, he wasn't circumcised, and the law came 400 years later after God said that. Abraham was saved by promise. He was saved by the grace of God. And God is saying what he would do, I will bless you, Abraham, from your seed. You will be the father of many nations, and you'll possess a land flowing with milk and honey, and you will be blessed. <coughs> he believed God that he could and he would do what he said he would do. But there was kind of a problem that we've been learning here on Sundays. 
Abraham and his wife Sarah were barren. They, they couldn't have kids. And God says, I'll bless you through your seed, through your own children. So barren would be kind of tough. And the next thing is when they have a kid, you know how old they are? They're 100 years old and 90 years old, not the best years for producing children. Abraham had every reason then to look around at his circumstances. I want you to hear that. He, all of circumstances preaches against it. Everything in the scene says, no, don't believe. But instead, he looks at the one who is making the promise and with God, all things are possible, except for one thing, he can't lie. He can't sin. We live in a land that all it is is, it's, John MacArthur said, if everyone told the truth in one day, our country would fall apart. <laughs> it is all built on lies. God is not like that. What he says, he will do. And Abraham looked away from anything in his 100-year-old body he could not fulfill the promise by anything in a good old Abe. He looked only to God, and he believed the promise. He believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Isn't that awesome? A child was born to him, and they named him Isaac, which means laughter. So what does some guy... 3,000 years ago, have anything to do with me this morning? Boring. I knew I should have stayed home and started on my Easter basket just eating the chocolate eggs and all that good stuff. I'm going to show you it has everything to do with this morning. So if you'll look with me in Romans chapter 4, we're going to begin reading just in verse 21. And Abraham was fully assured that what God had promised, he was able to perform. Therefore, it was reckoned to him as righteousness. <clears throat> now, not for his sake only was it written that it was reckoned to him. So 3,000 years later, he's telling you it wasn't just for Abraham, but for our sake also, to whom it will be reckoned, logizomide, as those who will believe in him, God, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. It's not just Abraham. Abraham believed God, and Jesus said, Abraham saw my day, and he rejoiced. Abraham is in glory. He's in heaven, because he believed God, and it brought him into heaven. And so now he's coming and saying, that isn't just written for Abraham, that's written for anyone here this morning who will believe that God says, I did this to my son, and I will save everyone who will believe in him. I will bring you into my safe presence, and I will bring you into heaven and glory forever. And he says, I wrote this about Abraham for you this morning. Will you believe what God says to be true like Abraham did? Christianity is not a blind leap for those who are not modern thinkers. It's not just the ignorant religion. For the, it's, for, it's not for the movers and shakers. It's not just a leap into the dark, but it's a step into the light. What I'm going to challenge you this morning, it is choosing to trust your eternity, whether it be eternal life or eternal death, eternal heaven or eternal hell. I am choosing you to trust your eternity to God and not to yourself. I want you to trust what he says instead of what the world says because what I see is the world changes what it thinks every 20 years. You know, there was a time they thought the world was flat and there's just all these little philosophies they have. Uh, um, um, I'm forgetting the word that uh, we evolved, evolution. And all these different things, they're gonna just keep coming up with all these things and are you going to base your eternity on what the world says? Or even worse, I'm God and I know best. I know how to get eternal life. That's jumping into the dark. So I'm going to hold out to you the same promise that God made to Abraham 3,000 years ago. God will save you by his doing. And he will do it through his son, and it'll be to the one who will just believe in God, who will look at that transaction 
and say that's the only way to be right with God. That's what God says he will do to the one who will believe. He will credit Christ taking sin, his righteousness being put to your account so that now God can look at you and say you're not guilty. I declare you not guilty, the God of the universe, and I reconcile you to myself and I adopt you into my family as your child. Are you gonna believe what the world says? Are you gonna believe your own heart that is deceitful? Or will you believe the living God who created the heavens and the earth and has declared in this word of God that the one who believes this will be saved? Will you believe? And as I close, belief is not just a mental assent. Belief is a trust. So it's not enough that you just agree with doctrines or things that I just said. If you see the glory of Christ this morning, to believe means I'm gonna give my life to it. I'm gonna give my life to this person. You are Lord of my life. You, you guide my life. You call the shots. You're the only way I can be saved. You, I, I'm, I'm giving myself to you and to you alone. From here on forth, I draw this line, I believe. And I give myself to the Lord Jesus Christ. Instead of playing around and faking this and living a joke of a life, he wants you to believe this morning. To believe this is to trust yourself to the living Christ. All to Jesus I surrender. And I come and I give. What I just described demands your life, your soul, your all. Well, get so my demands that you lay everything down. And this becomes the center of your life, the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what he's calling for. Anything else is unacceptable. This is what Jesus is asking for of his followers. And what does that have to do with Romans 4? Let me finish. We're going to look at the verse now. That was your introduction. <laughs> Sorry. I'll, I'll buy you ham and eggs afterwards if you come see me if you're visiting. Verse 25. So he who was delivered up because of our transgressions, and I love that word delivered up. It wasn't things just went bad. He was delivered up. God delivered his son up to be that logizomai, to be what we needed to be made right with God. And I was thinking about this. I've shared it before, but I don't know why Barabbas always jumps out at me. And Barabbas was one of the prisoners who was in prison, and he was waiting to die for being an insurrectionist. And so he's just sitting in that prison cell. He's a robber, he's a murderer, and he's just awaiting his execution. And Pilate really had no concern for this guy at all. And Pilate, his wife says, don't have nothing to do with that righteous man, and he knows he's not guilty. And he wants to save Jesus, and he keeps coming up with all these ideas, and finally he just says, all right, I'll give you a choice. Pilate is astonished. You can have Jesus or this horrible murderer, Barabbas. Which do you want? And it just should be simple. Here's this godly Savior sitting here. We want Jesus. And they all yell, no, we want Barabbas. We want Barabbas. And I just want to picture him sitting in a prison cell awaiting his execution. And he's just kind of looking at his hands knowing they're about to be pierced through. And all of a sudden he hears a crowd roaring outside the prison, crucify him, crucify him. And then all of a sudden it sounds like they're yelling my name. Why are they yelling Barabbas? And all of a sudden the jailer comes and he unlocks his cell and he's thinking now it's his execution time. And he says, no, you're going to be set free. Jesus of Nazareth is going to die in your place. It doesn't say, but I, I think he probably followed the processional. And he goes and he watches the Son of God crucified and most likely every hammer blow was meant for me. Every pain, everything that was endured on that cross should have been mine. And as that cross was lifted up, I should have hung on it. And so Barabbas can say, Jesus took my physical place, but Jesus took our spiritual place. We deserved eternal punishment, and he was delivered up for our transgressions. There's no other way to get the stain of your sin removed than Jesus being delivered up in your place to be punished for your sins. And then the last part of the verse says that he was raised because of our justification. And justification is this term that now before God, as a guilty sinner, you're, you're declared not guilty because of the work of Christ. And now he can adopt you 
and bring you back into his presence. And you really are, you're now a child of God uh, in the family of God. And so he was raised up so that we could be brought back into a relationship with God, that we could stand in his presence blameless with great joy. He was raised up this morning. Why we celebrate is so that we could be just and be right with God and dwell with him and have a relationship and be in his family. Isn't that worth celebrating? He's been raised for our justification, and so I close out. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. He is risen. Amen, Timmy. That's beautiful. And so if you are visiting and you want to know this God, it's too good to throw this letter away. It's better than $20 million. I, that is eternal life, everything that you need. I'm going to be up here afterwards with some of the other pastors, and I'm just going to ask that you would come and get this settled in your heart, life, and soul on this Easter morning and, and believe what God says to be true versus what man says in your own flesh and your own heart. We can trust God for our eternity. Let's pray. Oh, Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for how you dealt with man's dilemma, with the dilemma between how can sinners dwell in the presence of a holy, just God who we had sinned against and offended. God, I thank you that the answer in your wisdom was the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you that he lived the life that we should have, and he died the death that we deserved for our sins so that salvation can be in no one else. There is no other way that a man can be right with God than through the Lord Jesus Christ. And I thank you that you didn't make it some mecca or some system that we would have to obey to get that gift. All you're asking for is an empty hand with nothing of self and a faith that will look to Christ and give themselves to the Lord Jesus Christ. God, let no heart walk out of here without surrendering to the most beautiful one, the Savior of mankind. God bless, pour out your spirit. Do that mighty work in our midst, we pray. Amen.